Bingo. All right. Um, so this is what we're going to do this week is sort of um, is a lab that that normally actually I think we would have done it last week, um, week three instead of week four. Um, it's basically some practice. It would it would normally be um, set up a distillation and do a distillation and then take some data and plot it. So we can't really take the data but ourselves, but that's the boring part anyway. Um, because it's literally let 10 drops, you know, watch something boil. Every time you collect 10 drops, you switch it out and you put something else underneath it, or you you count how long it take to, took to get those last 10 drops. Um, so instead, I'm just going to give you the data in terms of time and volume of distillate and what the temperature is. Um, and you guys are going to do some of the plots that they talked about in last week's um, distillation lab. <clears throat> Let me go to share screen here. There we go. And you do not want to do the ICA from GenChem, although you guys just had it last year. Does that look familiar? How many mo water molecules are in Lake Tahoe? Um, but let me pull up the OCHEM lab, lab textbook. Um, and essentially the, the difference between a fractional distillation, which is what we're going to be um, simulating today. Normally I would have you do both of these, um, but the difference between a fractional distillation and a simple distillation um, is that a simple distillation, you're, you're essentially limited to basically, you can do one step on this, this composition curve, right? So if we started at 50-50 mole percent benzene in this case, um, it's going to boil at a certain point. And then if you draw that horizontal line over to the side, you see um, that would be the, the composition of the vapor phase. So this is what we were talking about last week, right? And look familiar to everybody. Um, what we can do with a fractional distillation is essentially a fractional distillation um, adds a condenser before you get to what's called the still head. The still head is the part where it comes off towards the side and you start collecting the vapor. Um, if you add a condenser before that, um, you basically gave the chance all of that vapor that's, that's evaporating a chance to condense on the side of the, of the um, vertical condenser, and then it has a chance to evaporate again and repeat that process. And so essentially what you're doing is it gives you the ability to do multiple steps at the same time. Um, on this graph. So instead of being limited to um, just um, just getting from 50% to 72% here, well, when this recondenses, now it's like you're starting right here where that the cursor is. And now if it re-evaporates again, you get another horizontal step that's up near 90%. And if you can have it happen a third time, you're up in the high 90%. So fractional distillation, you can do this by hand. And that's what, um, what they mean, the old school way of doing it um, would be to actually set up to do a distillation, take the stuff that you collected and then distill it again, like we talked about a little bit last week. Um, and so that's what meant when you know certain, certain liquors will advertise as being triple distilled. Um, triple distilled literally just means that you distilled it three times. We can get the same effect using a fract fractional distillation and only do it once um, if we set up our, our apparatus the right way. And so frequently what that will look like, so on the micro scale, it would look something like this, where we added a column. Um, it's, it's referred to as a distillation column between where we're heating and where we would be collecting. And this, or if it was coming off to the side, it would be over, over on this side. Let's see if I have a, Where's my other textbook? Um, Gilbert, that's the one. And fractional distillation in Gilbert. Simple. So a fractional distillation, if it's a little bit bigger, would look something like this. 
So you'd set up your, your sample that was going to be boiled down here at the bottom. You would have this extra condenser here that you may or may not even run water through. And a lot of times it's, you use what's called a packed column, which means you just put a bunch of inert material like copper, um, metal, that's uh, in the form of like, um, like those copper scrubbers that you can get from the dollar store for scrubbing stuff. If you get some of copper that's like a copper ribbon, you basically would pack it in there and that would allow lots of surface area for your sample to condense as a vapor and then re-evaporate and then recondense and then re-evaporate and recondense all before it reaches the head up at the top where then that once it condenses over here, it comes down into your collection vessel. Um, and so this, this has the, the overall effect of basically, if you make your column long enough and, and go slow enough, it has the effect of almost infinite number of distillations. You can get to almost any purity you want um, with only one real distillation set up. Um, so that's the, the difference between a fractional distillation and a simple distillation is just using that. And that's the same as what I was talking about in the, um, when they're refining oil, they do the same thing, except that they have a bunch of different heads, a bunch of different collection ports where they can take a sample from right here. And that's going to be everything that condenses at a certain temperature. And then they take a sample a little bit higher up and that's going to be everything that condenses at a little bit low or a little bit higher of a temperature. Um, and so that allows them to basically, they, um, in chemical engineering terms, they have run what's called a continuous process, which means refineries never stop. They literally just keep feeding in crude to the bottom um, and they can continuously collect the product at all these different heights. And every time they shut it down, it costs them a huge amount of money. Um, and so they really are, that's one of the reasons why refineries are, um, why the supply of gasoline is more or less constant, despite demand might go up and down, prices might go up and down, but they can't just start making more gasoline because the, the distilleries or the refineries, which are distilleries basically, are already operating at a constant level and they can't really adjust that. <clears throat> Sean, what's making it evaporate again in that column? So essentially you're going to have in that column, um, you're going to have a, a temperature gradient. The stuff that's closest to the bottom will be the hottest, right? Just because that's where you're heating it. And so if the, if the temperature at the bottom is say hundred Celsius, the temperature at the bottom of the column might be 80 Celsius and the temperature, the middle of the column might be 60 and 40. And so it's literally just that you have a temperature gradient. Um, along the way. And so whatever condenses first is most likely to then recondense ab up above. Um, and so it's, it's really, it happens naturally. If you give it enough space and surface area to recondense, it will do that naturally because you're heating it from the bottom. Uh, let's make sure I get so that that's the whole idea with the distillation. And then it, this procedure normally would have you run a simple distillation and then a fractional distillation um, to compare the two. Um, and so that's the information that's given in the data. I included the data as an Excel sheet. Um, and there's a lot of, I believe that there's two tabs. So let me, um, download this and get it opened. Um, but there's going to be one tab that's the distillation data. And that's going to be your, in, your time and your temperature and the volume of the distillate that you've collected. Um, and so when we, when we plot these, if we make a temperature versus time graph, we should be able to see plateaus um, or at least a change in the shape as we have different substances condensing and being collected. Um, and then the other tab is going to be for the gas chromatography, which is the second step here um, that we'll talk about in a second. Let's see, was there, there was something else I was going to say about distillation. Mm, let's see if I can recall. All right, so um, 
that's going to be the, the main basis for what you guys are going to do here. And then the other aspect is um, we're going to use chromatography, which, you know, we talked about thin layer chromatography and column chromatography the other day. Remember that's, you know, the whole idea is that you have one, one phase that's moving and one phase that's stationary. And the more interactions you have between the stationary phase and your sample, the faster it'll move through. And the more interactions, the mo sorry, I said that backwards. The more interactions you have between the stationary phase and your sample, the slower it goes through. And the more interactions you have between the mobile phase and your sample, the faster it goes through. So it's, it's same logic as column chromatography, um, except when we start talking about gas chromatography, gas chromatography is the same thing, except it's basically, um, it's computerized and can be very, and can be a lot more automated and a lot more accurate. So here's a very detailed diagram of what a gas chrom um, chromatograph might look like. Um, you may have remembered seeing one of these in the lab in, at LTCC. It was a big blue and beige box in the back by the sink. Um, that was one of these from the 70s. They're usually a lot smaller now. Um, but essentially, the, the actual process is actually really straightforward. Um, you use a gas, usually helium or an, an inert gas, sometimes nitrogen, sometimes argon, um, to basically, as your mobile phase, and then you have this big coil of, of really thin tubing that ha is packed with these beads, just like a column, um, column chromatography. And then the question become, uh, and then what happens is as you put your sample in there, it gets pushed through by the helium gas, but it's a long enough and you can make this whole sample small enough that you can have a really, really long column for the size of your sample. Um, when we usually we're, they're talking about using a syringe to do this. The syringes are, well, you will add like a microliter of your sample would get put in with the syringe. It's a tiny amount. Um, which means in that tube is then very, very small. And what happens is when it comes, when the gas exits out, we just have something that can turn, can tell if there's anything organic um, that's, it, that's being carried along with the helium. So, and then what that does is it just turns that into a signal that we can then interpret using Excel. Um, and that's, that's what this other um, set of data is. It's saying, okay, for the simple distillation, this is the first, the first half of the sample that came out. We then took that and tested it with the GC. And our results are just going to be in terms of time and signal. Um, and these are actually, I believe this is data from last year. And each of these is like a thousand data points. Um, so definitely want to do this with Excel rather than by hand to graph this. But if you did something as simple as just add a um, scatter plot with that many data points, you probably don't want the individual markers to show up, but if you just show, set it up to look like this, this is what the actual signal would look like, is you would get something like where you would have time on the X and then signal, which is just sort of an arbitrary term um, to mean how much of something you have. And so your GC, data that you're actually going to analyze, we're actually looking for the integral of each of these peaks. Um, and because the integral is proportional to the number of moles. So we can actually figure out the mole fraction of both of these compounds. These are, these are analogous to if we were doing a column chromatography um, to the, the different layers that we would see, or if we were doing thin, um, the uh, paper chromatography, the different spots that we would see. Um, we just have them as peaks instead. And if we look, the advantage of, of gas chromatography of GC is that we can integrate this to actually get a number for how many moles of each we have. Right, so the, and that's going to be the, the heart of the analysis is basically going to be making graphs like this for the four samples. Um, and if I wanted to look at the sample, if I wanted to add the data for um, the tails for the end of the sample. We could see what a different one might look like. So there's our X's, here's our Y's.
and we see that we get two different, very different lines, right? So at the very beginning of our sample, we have a lot more of both of these. And at the end of our sample, we have a lot more of the second peak and almost none of the first peak left. Right, so this is gonna be the way that we can analyze these and figure out what the mole fraction is after we're done with our distillations is by looking at these. Um, then the question is, what do we, how do we integrate this? Is usually the next question, at least for those of you who have had calculus and for whom the word integration brings back flashbacks. Um, integration is not usually everybody's favorite part of calculus. Um, because you don't even get something handy like the chain rule that's that always works with integration. It's not always going to work. Um, so I'm going to teach you a trick real quick for that. The nice thing about Excel and having a thousand data points is that you don't need to use calculus. You guys remember how we how you first were taught what an integral was when you learned those of you who have had calculus, it's not just how to do it, but what what is an integral. Nobody, some of these had calculus more recently than I have, right? I'll say I'm just learning it now and it's it's a bunch of rectangles that basically you find the area. So you're, you're getting a thousand rectangles. Bingo. We're gonna use the, tr the rectangle method for approximating an integral, which if you remember first learning that was basically like, okay, take your function and then you use your function to figure out what the height is at a certain um, X value, and then you take that height and you multiply by the width of your rectangle, which we denote with DX. That's what the DX stands for in an integral. So essentially with enough data points, we don't need to do the calculus because we can just brute force it with Excel. We just say, okay, what is Delta X? What is the change in X between our data points? What's the difference in minutes between data point two and data point one? And so we can just say, okay, I'm going to take dx is the width of our rectangle and the height of our rectangle is just gonna be signal. It's gonna be our y value. So if we wanted to make an, another column for the integral for these ones, and I'm actually gonna switch this out, change my data here so we can look at the other one um, while we're doing this. So we take those as our X's and those as our Y. Our series name is Tails for the Fractional. So if we want to know, if we want to be able to integrate what's underneath this peak, we're just going to take from one of these data points, we're just going to say, okay, our DX is the change in time and our height is the signal. So our integral at for the area of any one of those boxes is just going to be the change in time, which is the current time minus the last time, final minus initial. We're literally going backwards with calculus. Instead of getting more sophisticated with calculus, we're going backwards and becoming less sophisticated. But that allows us to then say, okay, times the signal. That's the area of the box at that first data point. And the units don't even make any sense. They don't even matter. All the units are is proportional to moles. So you can basically treat it like it's the number of moles, at least relative to the other peak. And so then if we, if we do this and copy and paste it for the whole thing, we get a bunch of numbers and all we have to do, if we want the total integral in between, say, you know, if we pick a spot on here and say, okay, we're going to look from, from 1.065 minutes until, whatever this one is, to 2.075. So 1.065 to 2.075. We just scroll down until we get to those numbers and we just say, okay, the integral of that peak is is the sum of all of those 
areas from 1.065. down to 2.075. A lot of data points, so. And again, so now that gave us an area. That is, that is the approximate integral for this entire peak between those two areas that I picked. So if we want to know what the mole fraction is, of peak two versus peak one, which is this tiny little peak at the beginning, we just keep track of what the peak area is for peak two versus peak one. And we could say peak one, let's say it's between that point right there, which is, and sometimes you have to hover, you have to play with it a little bit to get it to tell you correctly, there it goes, 0.725, and let's say it ends at 0.725 to, one of these times it's gonna work, and I guess maybe this is one reason why it would be helpful, to 9, 0.945, so 0.725 to 0.945, we'll do the same thing, 0.745 to 9.45, right? So what does that give us? This is all seems very abstract and not necessarily all that helpful. We took a bunch of numbers, we plotted them, we made up our own column by getting area. Just have to remember that if the area is proportional to moles, we can get the mole fraction by just finding the percentage of each of these peaks. So the mole fraction of peak two, peak two is equal to the area of peak two divided by the total area of both peaks. We get that gives us a mole fraction for our results without needing to know differential equations or even having taken calculus. All we need to really know is that the, that the area under the curve is proportional to moles and then we just brute force it with the sheer number of data points we have to get an approximate area. All right, so that's going to be most of what you do for the get for the GC data is going to be go through this you're going to get four different graphs actually I think as you do it is two different graphs um, with two sets on each graph. Um, and then figure out what your mole fraction is of each compound um, in the GC by using this method, by taking the change in X times the height to get that the area of that rectangle. Right, and this is essentially what you would be doing. This is actually exactly what you would be doing if we were doing this in lab. The only difference is you would have a little black box in front of you and you would actually take a syringe put a little sample in it, shove it into a black box, and then it spits out a bunch of numbers as a CSV file, um, which then we can take to Excel and analyze. All right, so this is also why I harp on Excel so much back in Gen Chem, is because almost every instrument you guys will ever deal with, its primary form of, out, of output is gonna be Excel files and spreadsheets. Right, so I think that's uh, enough to get you guys more than started here. I still have my Gen Chem lecture slides up. Um, you mind if I ask you a question real quick? Not at all. Would you be able to walk through the formula for column L one more time, please? Yeah, so 
column L was the one that this is going to be our rectangles, basically. And so the each of these rectangles and let me let me go to the board to show you what I mean by that. Um, if you haven't had had uh, calculus in a while or ever, if we had say a parabola, if we want to know what the area is between say, um, let's call that 0.5 and 2. If we want to know what the area is under that curve, calculus can tell us a way we can get an exact answer for what that area is. Um, but all we're going to do basically is say, okay, I'm going to treat this little section as a rectangle and then and say maybe it's a tenth of a of a um, unit wide. And then I'm going to make another rectangle that's a tenth wide. And so all we're really doing to get this, to approximate this area is we're just going to find the area of each of these little rectangles and then add them up for the area that we care about. So the, if we look at the dimensions of these rectangles, the width is just the change in the x value between one data point and the next data point. And the height is just the y value. Right, so all we're really going to do is take the, we're going to use the difference in x values times the y value. So that's all this formula is, is it's our current time minus our the time before that. Dx is probably going to be a constant for a lot of things, but some instruments have a different, they have a somewhat random dx. So we want to make sure we um, are just doing current final minus initial. So that's our dx times the height. Well, it didn't really make sense until you do the rectangles. Now I get you. Now I get you. I, I forget that not all of you guys have had calculus um, necessarily or recently, even if you have. Um, but this is, this works for almost anything where we, there's going to be a several different instruments in this class where we want to find um, the integral, the area under the curve is actually useful for us to know for some reason, usually because it's proportional to a number of moles. Um, and this is usually the way we would do it rather because we don't, even if we tried to use calculus to approximate this, we don't have a nice function, right? This function is does not look like it's shaped like anything we've seen in, in an algebra two class or a calculus class before, right? So if you don't have a, a function that you can integrate, then you really can't use real calculus to get an exact answer. So we might as well just make it easy for ourselves and just do dx times the height. Okay. And for determining what's what based off of the peaks is. So that's going to be similar to the, um, to when we were talking about chromatography two weeks ago, we basically said things, chromatography separates things, right? Because every compound will have a slightly different um, retention time. And so retention time is going to determine these, this X, um, axis is in minutes. So a little bit before one minute, we had a little tiny amount of compound come out. And then, and then it went back to the baseline. And then right after a minute, between one minute and two minutes, roughly, we had a whole bunch of a different compound come out. So the fact that we see if I switch this to being, um, you know, one of the other samples, let's, if we actually just do this. Um, If we look at this graph instead, all of our all of these samples are made of the same two compounds. It's acetone and benzene. And so they're all going to have peaks about the same time. The difference is how big are those peaks. And that's why we use that integral. We use that dx times the height and find our mole fraction of each. So our last sample, the tails of the fractional distillation was 97.7% of it was, was the compound that comes out second 
which is usually the bigger compounds. Um, whatever the larger compound is by mass, usually it's going to be the the um, the compound that is slower to go through the column. So then, so that's that's really what we're testing. The reason we have these two peaks is because we started with a sample that had a mixture of both of these of acetone and benzene. And then we did a distillation to try and get more of the, um, to get it to them to be more pure. And then we stuck it in the GC so we can analyze to see which one um, is more pure and what is the new mole ratio. And I think it has you calculate the starting mole ratio by just taking the starting conditions and making your own solution, which is gonna be like 50-50 by by volume, I believe. Oh, this is acetone and butanone, not benzene, but the data will work the same way. Um, and so it's 50% acetone and 50% butanone by weight is your starting material. And so then if you, if you use that to get a starting mass or a starting mole fraction, we can then compare that and say, okay, our simple distillation took a 50-50 mole fraction and turned it into 60-40. Um, and our and the fractional distillation, the first half of the fractional distillation is now 90% one compound and 10% the other compound. So we're we're comparing and contrasting simple distillation versus fractional. And we're using the GC to, sh to prove it, to give us numbers that say we actually got this much more pure than what we started with. All right, does that, does that make sense? All right. So I'll turn you guys loose on this. What you guys are actually going to be turning in is gonna be the data analysis section and answering the questions in the conclusion section here, um, as well as your, your Excel sheet that you make all your charts on and stuff, um, which I think I even listed that out. No, I didn't specifically list that out. So yeah, that's you're turning in your, your graphs from the data analysis section and then your answers to the conclusion, conclusion section are what you're gonna turn in for this. And hopefully this is a little bit more interesting and not too much more frustrating than reading a chapter on distillation like last week. You at least get fun numbers to play with and can make nice graphs. All right. You guys want to do breakout rooms? You guys all just want to stay muted and turn off your cameras and work here? You guys want to? How do you want to do this? Let's just stay on Zoom, maybe. I think that's easier than transferring all of us to another platform. So the yeah, break I agree. Breakout rooms are in Zoom. It just would give you an opportunity so like three of you guys could, you know, you guys could choose to work in the same room and chat with each other while you're doing it. And, but um, oh. we could try that. And s let's try it and see if you guys like it. And if you guys try it and don't like it, then just come back to the main room and I'll shut down the breakout rooms um, And in uh, a few minutes if it doesn't work out or if you guys haven't updated your Zoom. Um, stop sharing. There we go. Oh. All right, you guys get a pop up that says you can choose your own room. No. Okay. No. Then I will just, I'm going to undo that and then I'll just recreate them and assign you guys manually. Um, who wants to work in what room? Who wants to be room number one? I'll take two. Oh, <laughs> gotta make things difficult, Elke. Can I assume that you and Emily would like to work together? Yes, yes, and RJ. <laughs> and RJ. All right, and so we got a group of three. Who else? Anyone can join, feel free. Hey, anybody can join for any of these. If you guys all want to be in one big room, that's fine too. I usually find three is a good number though. Um, 
that's all. But I can put everybody in the same room and I'll just sit here by myself and you guys can chat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good setup. All right, I'm just gonna put put people in random rooms. Cool. I didn't realize you had all that extra data on the second tab in Excel. <laughs> I felt pretty dumb when I saw it. <laughs> there's another tab. It's like, oh, geez. Maybe I should wait till uh, we meet and like discuss it a little bit before I jump into uh, jump into getting started with it. Cool. I hit the wrong button, so I I joined instead of assigning you to um, one one of the uh, one of the rooms, and I'm just picking rooms at random. John, who do you know? Who do you want to work with? Or Olivia? Olivia, have you worked with any any of these, any uh, study groups or anything yet? Do you have any nope. preference? Nope, no preference. Sorry, I had to grab my charger. Uh, no worries. Uh, I'm going to put you in the room with John since you guys always seem to show up at office hours at the same time. So. Cool. I did it again. I sometimes I have issues with the breakout group thing. I um, oh I I didn't update my Zoom today like you were talking about. Yeah, it's okay. Nobody did, so I'm just going to I'm just doing it by hand. And it, oh. if you want the, to not have the awkward, you're either random or you have to tell me explicitly who you want to work with. Yeah, um, which is kind of awkward for people. Um, so if you want to be able to just pick your own, you just have to update your Zoom and then, gotcha. but it's not a big deal. Um, okay. I just, just got the, I just got the thingy. So I'm going to click cool. it. All right. I'll be here if you have questions.